For someone who says he wants privacy, we've heard a lot from Prince Harry lately. Interviews, a Netflix documentary, and most recently his tell-all book, Spare. We've heard about his rivalry with his brother, rows with his dad, the king, and he's shared some pretty personal details about his life, like when he lost his virginity in a field behind a pub at 17. But is all that really a sideshow? Because Prince Harry is about to begin what he's described as his life's work, reforming the British press, who he says have made his life a misery for the last two decades. He's accusing several tabloid newspapers of phone hacking, placing tracking devices on cars and even bugging hotel rooms. Not just his, but those of his friends and family too. I can understand why he's angry. All the things that happened to his mother. And when things happen to your family, you know, that's what people do. They, they go to war. I think he is at war. I don't think it's a campaign. I think he is at war. I'm Sally Lockwood, and this is the Sky News Daily. The voice you heard just then was Graham Johnson. He worked at some of the newspapers Harry's accusing during the period he alleged phone hacking was going on. We'll hear more from him in just a minute. But first, I'm joined in the studio by our royal correspondent, Laura Bundock. Laura, great to see you. Prince Harry is, of course, a story that, you know, we, we keep talking about because there are new developments all the time. Um, and now, of course, accusations against a number of newspapers. Uh, what's he claiming? I mean, look, we've been hearing a lot about Prince Harry, haven't we, ever since he stopped being a working member of the royal family. But bubbling away in the background were always these cases he had against the British tabloid press. It is no secret the extent of his hatred of the tabloids. And now we're starting to see these cases most likely come to court. And there are three major cases that he is involved in, and they are against the publishers of the Mail, the Mail on Sunday, Mail Online, publishers of The Sun, um, people who used to publish The News of the World, and the publishers of The Mirror as well. And so these three separate but huge cases are coming to court. And we're starting to get a sense by looking at what's going on in these cases uh, of how, and I, I use the word aggrieved, it doesn't even go far enough really, how angry, how frustrated, how how he wants to do something to tackle this now. And and this, this all these papers here is what he's doing. And, you know, from, from what I've read, he doesn't want to settle out of court. He wants to be heard. And some of the allegations are pretty explosive. So all of these cases, and it's worth pointing out, of the three of them, we only really know the details when it comes to the cases against the Mirror um, Group newspapers and the News Group newspapers as well, because the one involving Associated, the publishers of the Mail, etc., we haven't got that information. That That's not been released. But what we do know, we are getting a sense of the extent that he says his phone was hacked, uh, that his landline was tapped, that rooms were bugged, that cars were being followed. And it wasn't just for him personally, but people really close to him. So his brother, for example. But I think what stands out is a lot about Chelsea Davy, his then girlfriend, and how it was a constant thing with her. And you can just, for example, look at... this. Is the, this, these are some of the papers from the case, um, Duke of Sussex and News Group newspapers. That's published of The Sun and what was then the News of the World. And you can see the number of payments that have been made related to Chelsea Davy. There is page upon page upon page them. And some of these payments are for sort of small sums of money. Some of them run into the thousands of pounds. Such was the value of this kind of information. Information, he says, was all legally obtained. Just to give listeners an idea, uh, Laura's flicking through um, a really large document of, of claims and allegations. And, and, and what payments is it that are detailed in that. Payments to who? It varies. There is a range, but pay payments to people who are acting as private investigators, right. people who were photographers, some sort of freelance journalists as well. And you perhaps get a sense, as I say, of the value of things when you look at... I mean, just an example I've highlighted here. There was a payment dated the 18th of November 2007. The title was Chelsea P15 Pick Urgent, and that was a £6,000 payment. So whatever that, that bit of information was had had a huge value but 
as I say, Harry says it had this huge impact on his life. His personal relationships suffered incredibly. It led to this sense of huge general paranoia, distrusting people around him. And he believes that those who were at the very top got away with it, basically. So this is his moment, I think, to try and redress that. There were about five or six pups who were literally multi-millionaires during this period who used to fly around the world taking pictures of Prince Harry, Prince William and the royal family and their, their associates. And what, what's becoming clear now is they rely on information given to them by private investigators. This is Graham Johnson. He worked in tabloid newspapers for more than two decades during the 90s and noughties. The same period, Prince Harry is accusing some of these newspapers of repeatedly invading his privacy. And while Graham was investigations editor at the Sunday Mirror, he says on one occasion he was asked to tap a phone line by his deputy editor. Well, years later, Graham reported it to the police, pled guilty and was convicted for phone hacking. Now he uses his investigative skills to try to uncover wrongdoing by other journalists. He explained to me why newspapers were willing to spend so much money and take such risk to track down celebrities like Prince Harry. The rewards were so high that they had to be right all the time. So say, for example, you got a tip that Prince Harry was in Barbados or, or wherever, right? Now, before you pay for flights and hotels for your packs and for your news reporters and for you know their, their entourage and so on, it's cost effective for you to pay a private investigator to find out if that's right to corroborate it. So they would they would have people at Heathrow Airport and they would have specialist uh, investigators able to track planes and track passengers. Uh, all over the world by uh, getting into the manifests of various uh, airlines. And then you could also get into their phones, you know, phone hacking and listening to voicemails. And you'd be able to find out wh where they are by listening to their messages. And then also you could ping them. Private investigators would get into the, blag into the phone companies and they would be able to find out where Prince Harry was on a GPS system, you know, and then you'd be able to blag the hotels and all the rest. It was well worth these multimillionaire paps and their clients they are paying these investigators to do it. Just to clarify here, although some newspapers, including some of those being accused by Prince Harry, like the News of the World, have previously been found guilty of phone hacking, for others, the accusations remain just that, accusations. But Graham says he did witness this sort of thing happening. And Graham, from what you saw, did people who were involved in this sort of activity, say editors or even newsroom lawyers, question the ethics of what they were doing? No, no. Morality didn't really come into it, really. And, and reflection, there was no time for reflection. You know, it's a tabloid newsroom and it's reporters, you know, they move at 800 mile an hour. There's no time to reflect on the rights and wrongs of these decisions. And tabloid editors, I mean, they definitely knew about, not all of them, not all of them, of course. I, I work for some really good editors who weren't involved in, in these practices. And also, you know, there the, the were lawyers who I knew, knew about illegal use of private investigators. And, and that's a big part of Prince Harry's case against the Mirror Group. The lawyers knew about phone hacking and unlawful information gathering, but also the board allegedly knew about these practices. So what you're saying, Graham, is that, in your opinion, it went all the way to the very top of these newspapers. It wasn't just a few rogue journalists and private investigators who were doing this. And, and do you think the Leveson Inquiry, which looked into phone hacking back in the early 2010s, do you think it failed to uncover the true extent of all this? I think what the Leveson Inquiry didn't uncover is the scale of... I mean, I, I think it's organised crime. You know, I, I think it's organised crime. And what I mean by that is the scale of it, you know, how much money was spent on it and how many people were involved in it. There were hundreds of people, uh, millions, tens of millions spent on it. It was widespread across newspapers, private investigators, huge numbers of targets, thousands of targets. The time it went on, 
the kind of serious of criminality. You know, the, the newspapers are alleged to have committed burglaries to get information. So yeah, it's 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 similar to organised crime. Which ironically, that was my job at the Sunday Mirror to investigate organised crime, drug crime mainly. So it, it wasn't hard for me to start investigating all this in 2015. Do you think Prince Harry's court cases now will go further and, and expose more of what was actually going on? Yeah, so that's the, that's the whole point, really. So the, there was supposed to be a second part of Leveson called Leveson 2, which was due to start a, a few years ago. And that was going to investigate further criminality and relations between newspapers and the police and, and these more sinister private investigators. But that got cancelled by Ma Hancock when he was the culture secretary. So what people have had to do, basically, the claimants in these civil cases, it, it's been like an uphill struggle going through the High Court to get all of this information uh, disclosed from the various newspaper groups. And that's what they've been trying to do, is unearth this themselves in a piecemeal fashion. Now, what Prince Harry's done, he's kind of taken this process mainstream because of his status. He's a globally recognised figure. And, you know, that's put pressure on all kinds of organisations to take this issue seriously. And since then... Hundreds of thousands of documents have been disclosed. And now if the police became aware of these documents and the CPS and certain parts of government, they might wish to to reopen criminal proceedings. Now, Prince Harry has, has said he doesn't want to settle this out of court. He wants these lawsuits to go ahead. Do you think there are former newspaper editors journalists, private investigators who are nervous about what might unfold in these court hearings? Yeah, of course, of course, because, and, and this may come as a surprise to you, to your listeners, because most cases get settled out of court, right, because it's too expensive for the claimant to take it to trial, even if you win under uh, what's called adverse costs you might get hit with a £4 million bill. Now, someone like Prince Harry, he's got the financial clout to be able to take that risk. And therefore, that's what makes uh, editors and journalists who are involved in this quite nervous. <clears throat> because if it goes to trial, you know, they, they'll be getting named at trial. In a way, it's, it's a real shame that it's had to come to this because I don't want to see journalists go to jail. I also don't want to see, you know, the estimated £200 million, which the Mirror Group has spent, my former employers have spent, on phone hacking. I don't want to see them have to spend more because that's just money taken away from their news budgets. They, they could employ hundreds of journalists for, for this kind of money. Instead, they're making them redundant. So it's a shame that it's come to this. And it's uh, my view is if the papers would have been open and honest and, and and talked openly about this, it wouldn't it wouldn't have reached the situation and it certainly wouldn't have set journalists against journalists. I mean, it's, it's very difficult for me. You know, I, I've had to in, investigate this without fear or favour. And some of the people who've come across my radar have been my former colleagues and it's really difficult for me. You know, I don't, I don't want to make life miserable for them. But it's the same old story. It's the senior executives and the bosses and the board members who get away with this and they make the the people at the coalface like me pay for it. Clearly, Graham agrees with Prince Harry that there's plenty more to be uncovered when it comes to what went on in tabloid newsrooms in the past few decades. Back to Laura. I think for many involved in these cases, there was a feeling that Leveson didn't go far enough, mm. that those senior executives, people who might have signed off payments and things, didn't end up in prison, basically. And I think that's what Harry has made it very clear in interviews. He wants to happen. There is a huge denial, obviously, from the newspapers that they've done anything wrong. But I think Harry 
as he says, this is his life's work. He wants to change the media landscape. And even his own father, the king, has said, are you on a suicide mission attempting this? But I think he feels so strongly that there were people in the press who were breaking the law, who were lying. He wants to take it as far as he can and won't rest until he has. And many wouldn't blame Prince Harry for for doing this, given the impact that tabloid intrusion has had on his life. Yeah, I mean, I think if you read his memoir, Spare, and, you know, there's lots of takeaways from that book, and whatever you feel about Harry, there is nobody who could look at him describing his mother's death and feel huge sympathy for him. He was such a young boy, and he speaks, doesn't he, in interviews about being in the car with her. She was driving. He was a little boy in the back, hounded by paparazzi. And I think he has never accepted really what happened to his mother. He has never felt that the journalists, the paparazzi who were trying to take photos at the time were never really held to account properly, that they should have been. And that he wants to take it this far. I think he cannot settle until this is sorted or he feels he's had as big a go as he can at trying to sort this. And, it, and it's Prince Harry essentially saying, this isn't OK, this may be the status quo, but it's not OK. How much do you think we could see real change come about from, from this legal I think challenge? It's, it's interesting, isn't it? And if you speak to people from Hacktoff, the big campaign group that's been fighting for a lot of the very high profile people who, who said they had their phones hacked, they will say, look, he's just another example of what was going on. Without a doubt, as I say, he, he is a big name for all of this. But he, Harry, I think, will need to be able to convince people as well. So it's one thing to have a legal decision, but he splits opinion, doesn't he? Regardless of the legalities of what comes of the or what doesn't come of these cases, they could all settle, who knows? But he will need to bring the people with him if they want to effect proper change. But I think there is a hope certainly from many campaigners, privacy campaigners, that it could bring about some change. But for Harry personally, it's much riskier for him, I think. I mean, it's you don't get members of the royal family going in court. It just doesn't happen. It was really, really unusual anyway. I mean, Why is it risky? It's risky for him. What's he got to lose? Well, I think he's got a few risks. I mean, there, I mean, there is a risk just naturally by putting himself in court. Members of the royal family do not go in court. They don't want to be there. So it's really unusual to see him taking this stance in the first place. I mean, financially... He is putting himself at risk because by refusing to accept any settlements, you know, there is a financial cost. Does he need the money? No. Does he have the money to pay for this? Yes, he does. We know he's made a lot of money since he's been giving interviews, the Netflix series, the book, etc. But I think there's a bigger risk to him as well, and that is his reputation. It's a reputational risk, really, because I think to many people, perhaps, he is seen as this person, certainly in, the, in Britain, who has left the royal family under a cloud and in terms of his own PR and trying perhaps to to win over support here, which he will need if he wants to bring about meaningful change in all of this, will he bring people with him? And and that that's that's the risk. Does he care about that? Perhaps not, because his audience is an American audience now, as we know. And do we have a date for these court appearances yet? They are all coming up. So some are before the coronation, some are after the coronation, and then they will take weeks. Some of them will take weeks and weeks and weeks. Harry himself could give evidence, though. I think there's a lot of suggestion that certainly in the case against Mirror Group newspapers, he could he could come then, which would be huge to see him at the High Court. But make no mistake, everything we've heard about William throwing him to the grounds in Nottingham Cottage, his issues with Camilla, with his father, with, with their relationship with the press, this this is a big, big deal for, for Prince Harry. You cannot underestimate how strongly he feels about this and how far he will go in this fight with Fleet Street. It's got the makings of another Netflix documentary, doesn't it? The Prince versus the Press. Is that something you see happening? No more Netflix <laughs> documentaries, please. Please, no more. I'm sure there could be a season two. Um, if we say it out loud, maybe it won't happen. I don't know. Who knows? I guess, I guess it depends on how it ends. Oh, yes, we know how it's starting anyway, and that's very soon. But yeah, where it goes, I, I can't even begin to guess. Well, Laura, we will no doubt revisit this and speak to you regularly for this royal reality drama. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. My thanks to Graham Johnson and Laura Bundock and to you for listening to the Sky News Daily with me, Sally Lockwood. This episode was produced by Rosie Gillett. Our editor is Philly Beaumont. <laughs> 